Hail to the chief and the other chief and the other chief. That might be what the Marine Band has to do if Ben Franklin gets his suggestion of a plural president. Not one man in office, but three or five or six. We still have an offer running. 1888, you get the entire archive. Go to www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics. You get the archive, most of the podcasts that we've recorded. He has a passion for reputation and fame. Time and thoughts chiefly employed in obtaining it. He has the most affectionate and insinuating way of charming the man or woman he's focusing on the most silly and ridiculous imaginable in the sight of an American. But it succeeds in Europe. John Adams, speaking of Dr. Franklin. His language is violent in public company. My apprehension is that the union between France and the States will be diminished because of it. Luckily, I hope, there is imputed the true cause, a disorder of the brain. Ben Franklin, speaking about John Adams. I suppose newspapers must be wrong when they say that Mr. Adams has taken up his abode with Dr. Franklin in Paris. He hates Franklin. He hates Jay. He hates the French. He hates the English. To whom will he adhere? Thomas Jefferson, in a letter to James Madison about Adams. Jefferson went off yesterday from his post of Secretary of State, and a good riddance to bad wear. I hope his temper will be more cool, and his principles more reasonable in retirement. He has talents, I know. Integrity, I hope. But his mind is now poisoned with a passion for faction. John Adams, in a letter to Abigail, about Thomas Jefferson. He has a better heart than head. Jefferson about Adams. A perfect Quixote of a statesman. James Madison about John Adams. Mr. Madison is a studious scholar, but his reputation as a man of abilities is a creature of French puffs. John Adams on James Madison. Jefferson is certainly a man of subliminal and paradoxical imagination, entertaining of propagatory notions, inconsistent with dignified and orderly government. Alexander Hamilton on Jefferson. Hamilton has good abilities and great industry, but may have too much disposition to intrigue. John Adams on Alexander Hamilton. President Adams is more mad than I ever thought him. He shall soon lead some to say he is wicked as he is mad. Alexander Hamilton on John Adams. He really appears to be a shim-sham politician. Declaration signer Abraham Clark, writing about Alexander Hamilton. So there you have it. I think what we can see from all of this founder to founder trash talk is that there never really was a group of people who existed in early America who agreed on everything. More than getting rid of British rule and any such notion is a silly one. Early Americans, including the celebrities who we all know, who would line our history books, disagreed with each other, argued about basic principles of government some of which, many of which, we still argue about today. Sometimes they compromised. Sometimes they were bitter about that compromise. 
Yet sometimes you wouldn't know it today in the media, TV hosts dressed up in colonial garb, making references to the Founding Fathers to support one position or another. This doesn't reflect necessarily a lie my teacher told me. Now, I like the Davis book, by the way. I think that teachers sometimes get a bad rap. You know, there's only so much time in a U.S. history class at high school. You do get taught about some of the conflicts in early America, Federalist, Republicans, the like. But it is up to adults to go beyond the learning of high school, which is shrunken for time constraints, and learn more, right? Let's not blame the teachers. When adults, particularly those adults who have TV programs, blogs, or newspaper columns, use simple and possibly incorrect assumptions, they should be called out. That's why I call this cast and a few other casts that will follow it, Lies My Talking Head Told Me. I think there'll be three of them, two following this one. But the first one is that the Founding Fathers said this or that. Now, the first question to ask is, who is a Founding Father and who is not? And the other is, when did they say any one thing? Oh, come on now, we know the Founding Fathers, you know, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, Adams, Madison, right? Well, that is a small group, the ones that you hear about, the celebrities. And even they didn't agree. But you even need to go beyond this group to capture the real decisions made about the nation's founding, some of which still affect our laws and the way our politics work today. Only a handful of people were in both the Continental Congress that signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitutional or Federal Convention that met in Philadelphia in 1787 to work out a document of government. Declaration signers can certainly be considered founders. I mean, without their signature, where would we be? But they're an oft forgotten bunch. And some, this is where it gets a little complex, like Richard Henry Lee of Virginia or Abraham Clark of New Jersey opposed the Constitution, as did, at least initially, the very enthusiastic members of Congress from Rhode Island, who during the independence debates, no brainer supported independence, were completely absent. That state was completely absent from the constitutional discussion. Okay, Bruce, well, you might say, forget all this. When we see founders, let's just talk about those people who were in the federal convention because they made the form of government. The one that met in Independence Hall, 1787. Okay, you got 55 people, a few left early, a few didn't sign, a lot of different viewpoints inside that state house. Debates were kept secret, sentry guards at the door, which were locked. Windows were shut because, yes, there were people on those cobblestone streets outside, sometimes trying to get a little listen in to what might be said. We don't really know everything that's said. We have notes from James Madison and a few others. Elbridge Gary, Edmund Randolph... George Mason, they sat through the convention, but they didn't sign the resulting document. So they disagreed with parts of it. Small states and large states would get into a tussle during the discussion and the convention. Gunning Bedford of Delaware threatens that his state might leave and join a foreign power. Ben Franklin calls for a minister to come and have a prayer. Hamilton is mostly outvoted by his anti-federal New York colleagues. Voting was by state delegations. Hamilton didn't have the votes. Washington's silent throughout the convention, merely presides. He's the president of the convention, listening to everyone else and making sure everyone has the correct amount of speaking time and that the rules are followed. He only makes one small comment about the actual substance of the Constitution at the end. Jefferson and Adams, who no one would doubt are founders, right? They're out of the country and not present in this room. Although, Through their letters and writings, they would have influence on others, and others influenced them as well. This convention, which met over several months in 1787 during the summer, gets locked between supporters of representation in government by population. So if you're a larger state, you're going to get more representation in the central government, so-called the Virginia Plan, and what's known as the New Jersey Plan, that of William Patterson. Certainly someone who helped in the founding of the nation, but not well known outside of New Jersey. His plan called for the states to be equal in representation. Forget how many people are living there. Doesn't matter if Virginia is bigger than Rhode Island or Delaware. They get the same representation in the central government. Two very different ideas. And the convention hotly debates this. 
So much so that Washington fears that the convention is going to break up. The large states have enough votes to outvote the smaller states and accept the Virginia plan over the New Jersey plan. And the small states start threatening to leave. Washington knows this will be bad for the country, but it will also be bad for his own prestige. As accepting the presidency of this convention, he put his own reputation on the line. Out of this conflict rises a voice. Alexander Hamilton. Despite Washington's trust in him here at the convention, Hamilton has not been influential, outvoted by the New Yorkers. Well, now he gets up to speak. What provision will we make for the happiness of the country, he asks. Now, you might think here is where I'm going to say that Hamilton offered this nice compromise between the two plans and everyone was happy ever after. But he didn't. What Hamilton said in effect was, Both these plans are lacking, New Jersey and Virginia plans. What you need, and I'm sure he kept his eye on the sentries at the door and to see that the windows were shut when he said it, what you really want is a system like Great Britain. Yes, I know this won't be popular, but a strong central government, the best combination of public security and individual liberty you will find, a country taken seriously by the world. Then he went on to suggest... A lifelong president is what you need. Now wait, I know it's not popular, but no one is tied more to the state than the King of England. He and the state are one. His welfare is the state's welfare. That's what you want. Same with senators. Serve for life as long as there's good behavior. The states are very inefficient the way they are structured. You should have federal districts as equal in size as possible. Now there could still be local units as long as their power was subordinate to the federal government, who would handle local issues. And if you keep the states, I think you want a negative, where the federal government can veto state laws. He spoke for nearly a day, and when finished, William Johnson of Connecticut recorded, he was praised by many, supported by none. But nor was Hamilton the only variant idea at the convention. Franklin had his suggestions, too. Oh, this bicameral government that you have, House, Senate, it's a snake with two heads. Oh, and let's have the president and key officers work for no pay. I know some may think it's preposterous, but look at the sheriffs in England. They do well with no salary. The Quaker committeemen here in Pennsylvania, they get no salary as well. There's enough people of good merit and good stature who could volunteer for these positions to form a central government here. And the single president, it's dangerous. What if he dies? They hadn't yet thought up the uh, vice president idea. And one person with all that power. No, Franklin said, there should be several presidents, like a council of presidents that together would hold the executive power. So you can see from this that you had some very different ideas just in that group of, call them framers, call them founders, convention delegates, meeting in Philadelphia in 1787. It is true that they ironed out the conflict between the large and small states, with the House reflecting the population and the Senate reflecting the states. Roger Sherman, somebody who you have to count as one of these founders if you're going to speak that way, but not as well known was critical to the debate. Dr. Franklin, never one to miss being part of a good group of influential people at the right moment, was also part of the deal. An agreement that at the end of the convention, when everybody broke off and went to the city tavern for a light supper, going back to their states to now sell this document, not everyone was happy with what they did, but there was enough agreement. Which is an issue then with limiting this group of what you call founders, if you will, to just the people who were at the convention. The problem is the document that they signed was not complete. Something missing there. And what's missing are very common phrases. Freedom of speech, search and seizure, right to bear arms, the Fifth Amendment. None of that was part of the document that they had created. If they were founders at all, their founding was incomplete. Indeed, so much relied upon a group of 174 men, mostly different men from those that had been in Philadelphia, who were packed into an academy hall in Williamsburg, Virginia, the State House being under construction in June of 1788. 
eight months after the delegates of the convention had left in Philadelphia. Now, the Virginia Ratifying Convention meets. See, the convention actually had no authority to enact a governing document for the country, just to suggest one. So once suggested, it had to be ratified, approved by someone. Well, there was a Confederation Congress and they played a role. But it was sent to the states. The Constitutional Convention suggested that ratification occur with 9 out of 13 states and with special conventions operating in each state. Some states were quick in that process. Delaware, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, South Carolina approved it quickly. Virginia was one where all eyes were focused on. It was one of the largest states in the Union, certainly the largest state in the South. And when it opens on June 2nd, 1788, it's quite a meeting, big names, John Marshall, James Madison, Benjamin Harrison, signer of the Declaration of Independence, George Mason is there. He's there to oppose the Constitution. No one knows how the Virginia Ratifying Convention is going to go. It's nearly even as far as the political observers of the day can tell between the pro-Constitution forces and the anti-Constitution forces. It is at the beginning of the convention. The pro-forces unveil their weapon, and it is Edmund Randolph. We mentioned that he had left the convention in Philadelphia without signing the document. He had feared the fetus of monarchy that might be the result of the presidency. He had several problems with the document. But now he was here, and he had decided to support a yes vote. Yes, the Constitution was imperfect, Randolph said, but it was still better than nothing, still better than anarchy. But Randolph and the others ran into a brick wall and right from the start, in the form of the best orator in the state of Virginia, the tavern keeper and the self-educated lawyer, Patrick Henry who had risked treason back in the 1760s by urging liberty or death. Henry was opposed to this new constitution and ready to speak, scream, poke fun, stall, nitpick, whatever, to stop the constitution from passing. His imagery was clear. The ratification of the constitution would bring tyranny and oppression for sure. As John Marshall said, while Madison could convince, Henry could persuade. Though the convention, for instance, had adopted a rule that they would consider each of the provisions of the Constitution in a methodical fashion, Henry refused to play that game. He'd start talking about Congress, and then when he was counter-argued with, he'd bring up the tax system. He'd be talking about the dangers of a presidency, and then he'd say that Virginia would lose his militia. He jumped from topic to topic, wherever he could find a negative point. He aimed his comments sometimes at members personally. He called Edmund Randolph, for instance, inconsistent. Henry's arguments had an effect. Although we have been here eight days, Delegate George Nicholas said, little has been done. We have hardly begun to address the question. Indeed, it was 22 days later when the convention would vote. And there, Patrick Henry and George Mason wanted to push the matter and proposed a vote. There would be no approval of the Constitution from Virginia until a group of amendments were added first. The amendments would be a condition of Virginia's ratification. It is at the point of this motion in the Virginia Ratification Convention where as little as four and maybe as many as ten members of this convention who were previously thought of as anti-constitutionalists, where they voted against this motion. The vote went 80 to 88 in the convention and was defeated. And then, in a reversal of that, there were 89 yeas and 79 noes for a motion to ratify the Constitution with the amendments as a suggestion only. So, ratification first and then suggest to the Congress that will be created to make amendments. But who switched? How did the convention go from even to pro-constitution like that? Accounts differ, and there really is no real record of what everyone thought and what their positions were. Uh, one opponent of the constitution talked of 
six or seven dubious characters that controlled the way the vote would go. For his part, Patrick Henry singled out men like Peter Carrington of Charlotte, a leading judge in the state whose area around Charlotte would have opposed the Constitution, but Carrington felt that disorder was worse than an imperfect Constitution. Andrew Moore, another one singled out by Henry as a turncoat, was a captain of Washington's army who ignored instructions given to him by his constituents and voted yes. Humphrey Marshall, a delegate from what is now Kentucky, then the Kentucky District of Virginia, an area opposed to the idea of a strong central government, also voted yay, just like his cousin, John Marshall. Indeed, John Marshall and Edmund Randolph represented anti-Constitution areas, but won their elections to the ratifying convention through personal reputation, thereby swinging Virginia towards a yay vote. So Carrington, Humphrey Marshall, Randolph, Moore, these unknown names, and many others, some names might be lost to history, are in a sense just as much founding fathers as the ones we know, because they helped to strike the balance. Yes, we'll approve the Constitution as the federal Constitution discussed with all of its provisions, if we can add an amendment which will have the effect of a Bill of Rights. Virginia's ratification was extremely important, of course, and its vote was a mandate, but it still would have been a very odd-looking country, with a union in the North and South, with Massachusetts and South Carolina aligned, along with Virginia, but then to have the free state of New York in the middle, because at this time, June 1788, even though in the city of New York and the mechanics and merchants and tradespeople there really like the idea of a strong central government, the city of New York was pro-constitution. The rest of the state was largely not. The governor was against it. The majority of delegates going to the convention, which be held in Poughkeepsie, the same, starting the same time as this Virginia convention is going on, would be opposed to the constitution. The anti-Constitution majority was led by Melanchthon Smith, the former sheriff of Dutchess County. I had to call him a patriot. He was a formed a regiment of soldiers from Dutchess. It helped suppress loyalist activity in the county during the Revolutionary War. He probably wrote a series of letters under the pseudonym Federal Farmer, and he conspired with the state's governor, George Clinton, who was also an opponent of the Constitution. Smith was elected to the New York Ratification Convention and opposed every effort to approve the Constitution. He jousted with Hamilton and disagreed with Hamilton's contention that the states were the defect. He held off Robert Livingston, a delegate from New York City. He held up his opposition in the New York Ratification Convention all through June as Virginia was debating. Give the government an ability to tax, he said, and it will not be able to. It will be ineffective. And why that's bad is a general government won't be able to do it legitimately and then will have to resort to despotic measures. Indeed, he kept opposing it. That is until July 24th when something strange happened. Smith rose and said it was time to ratify. What happened? Why this turnaround? Well, Virginia had ratified and at this point notice had reached New York. But there was another influence. Melanchthon Smith had received a letter from his friend Nathan Dane, another forgotten man and perhaps a forgotten founder. I mean, indeed, if anyone is robbed of the title, he's the one that proposed as a member of the Confederation Congress, the oft-forgotten body that existed before there was a U.S. Congress under the Articles of Confederation, proposed in Congress that there should be a federal convention to start with. He has other accomplishments, too. Helped craft the Northwest Ordinance, which, among other things, strictly forbid slavery in the new Western territories. He also helped in his later years to develop a founding document of American law. Yet Nathan Dane is not remembered, probably because he couldn't get elected even to the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention or to the U.S. Congress that was created because he was perceived as being against the Constitution, which, in a sense, he was. See, he proposed to the Congress that they form a convention, but was shocked by what they came up with. Dane was a conservative, and all this federal power was a bit too much for him. He couldn't speak because he didn't get elected to the Ratification Convention in Massachusetts, but he did collaborate through others. Gradually, though, Dane came to change his mind about things, and he wrote to Smith. 
Though I retain my opinion on the feeble features of this document, its expansive powers and defective parts, I have ever thought that at the convention Rhode Island missed an opportunity by not attending. If they did, they could have engrafted into the document the solutions they now seek. Let's not make that mistake again, he writes to Smith. Men in all states who want free, equal, and effective government to the exclusion of anarchy ought to unite in their exercises in making the best of the Constitution now established. Melanchthon Smith now writes back to Nathan Dane, I entirely accord with your opinion. He asks only for time to put his party together. Dane and Smith, these are the forgotten moderates. Men not in the room in Philadelphia, or not in our textbooks today, but who influenced the document. So many people help the founding of the nation, not just big names. There are also the nameless beyond printers, mechanics, farmers, members of Congress, the voters who elected all of these people to the ratification conventions. The founding was just the endorsement of a document. Many of those terms were imprecise. What would the president do? What did advice and consent mean? Did the departments and the secretaries leading the departments work for the president, or did they work for the Congress? Could a central government build roads? Could it endorse a bank? How many courts would the federal government have? Should we have a navy? All of these questions. You can't look to any one group of founders in a room. All of these questions were decided as the result of presidential acts by the first few presidents, acts by the first few Congresses, and interpretations by the early Supreme Courts. That's an important point. Because in the drafting, as we mentioned, you had Hamilton outvoted, Washington silent, Marshall a mere delegate at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. So if you limited things to that, to the actual founding of drafting and of documents, that's not where these people had influence. In the early years, Washington would make his impact as the first president, along with Hamilton. Hamilton's treasury secretary would create a bank, create the type of finance system the country would have, sponsor industrial projects. Hamilton and Washington would work together to see that a federal excise tax was enforced. Marshall, as the chief justice of the United States, would really carve out a role for the Supreme Court that not many convention delegates had exactly imagined, and would interpret laws in a way that define the government that we have now. But you have to look at all of these people. If you start doing the addition on this, I'll make this point. There are more people that could be considered founders than would fit in any edifice that existed in early America. And I, I'm, I'm fairly certain about that. And I'm counting places in it. Carpenter's Hall, the Pennsylvania State House we now know as Independence Hall. The Indian Queen Tavern was pretty big, but not big enough. When you start counting ratification conventions, you're talking about, and in, in many cases, more than 100 people in each state. You're talking about significant printers and writers, both for and against the Constitution. You're talking about mechanics who, who marched. You're talking about all the early presidents, early Supreme Court justices, early members of Congress, the members of the Confederation Congress that accepted the letter from the convention and passed it on to the states. There was some debate over that, too. You're talking about a couple thousand people at least. How can anyone today in 2014 say they agreed on anything? Especially when, even when you break them into smaller groups, they don't agree. Now, one might say, this is all well and good what you're saying, but there had to be some agreement. And yeah, I do think it, it, it's not a complete mess. I mean, I do think there's some general themes that early Americans did agree on, but they're pretty general and hard to apply to today. I mean, all believed in Republican government, right? No sovereign. They might disagree on what point the people came in and made the decision. You know, for Hamilton, it was just in that one body, the House of Representatives, electing people every three years, or whenever president died or had to be replaced due to bad behavior, same with senators. But the people, even Hamilton's uber or ultra federalist view, the people were sovereign. Generally, and Hamilton is really an exception here, but as we said, as his views were not accepted at the time, there was a belief in that you needed both states and a central government, though which one was larger was just as much a debate then as it is today. But before we go too far with that, here's another important point to make. Even among opponents of the Constitution, or a majority of opponents of the Constitution, you see this in the writing of many of them, 
even if some may not imagine that there would be a president of the United States coming out of that convention, that there would be a, a Congress with all sorts of powers, it's fair to say a majority agreed that they wanted a stronger central government than what they had under the Articles of Confederation after the Revolutionary War. That they wanted a Congress that wouldn't get bogged down having to have a unanimous vote for everything. None of these general tenets that I've outlined are enough to satisfy most uses of the term founding fathers in today's media. Rather than a founding fathers, there was a founding people, a people with disagreements, a public discourse just like the one that we have today. A discussion vivid of considerable complexity, people with desires and motives that even in their own thinking, they couldn't always make whole, that wanted things that might be contradictory. They were living people as we are living people today. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics. We still have an offer running. 1888, you get the entire archive. Go to www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics. You get the archive most of the podcasts that we've recorded. Been doing this since 2006. Thanks for the support of those who have purchased the archive so far. Much appreciated. If you do like the program, please tell someone about it. Give us a review on iTunes, favorite us on Stitcher, or just tell someone about it on your blog, your Facebook page, etc. Helps the program and helps other people to find this program. Thanks for listening. <laughs>